The final talk for this evening is by our own Professor R. Ramanujan from Institute of Mathematical Sciences. He is a professor in theoretical computer science. His research interests are in mathematical logic and theory of computation and their applications to theory of distributed systems, game theory and security theory. He has been an active volunteer of Tamil Nadu Science Forum since 1990 and uh, most recently he is a recipient of INSA's Indira Gandhi Prize for Popularization of Science 2020. So please welcome him on, on to the dais. Society depends on many algorithms, many procedures like providing infrastructure, holding elections, imposing taxes, there are many of them. And they all have some underlying logical structure. And I want to convince you, hopefully, that understanding the structure is worthwhile and actually important. So uh, many of the ideas that I'm discussing here originated uh, from the work of Rohit Parikh and in joint work with him. So that's acknowledgment. So I think this is moving fast. What's happening? I just, it's moving without clicking. Some problem with the clicker. Yeah. Okay, so here is a queue. It's a queue at, the, at an ATM. Okay, so a queue is something that I can call a social structure. So in front, when you stand in the, go to an ATM, you stand in a queue. It operates on a principle of first in, first out. And it implements our idea of fairness. The idea that somebody who comes early gets served first, somebody who comes later, gets served later. Now it works in a bank, and people give dirty looks if you jump the queue, and somehow the dirty looks is part of ensuring that you stand in the queue. Okay, what about a bus stop? What happened to my bus stop? Okay, the bus stop vanished. It's, I wanted to show you a Mumbai bus stop, and uh, so you, you see all these people standing in, even in, uh, in rain. In fact, first when I went to Mumbai, I was very surprised by queues where, you know, bus stops were actually structured so you actually stand in a queue. Can you imagine doing that? And, uh, but, and people would actually stand in queues like that, except when the bus comes, something happens. <laughs> right? At that point, you want to get onto the bus rather than enforce rules. Right? I would like to give dirty looks, but there is no time. Right? Bus will go. So, now, we don't see any inconsistency in this. In, the, in front of the ATM, you're willing to stand slowly. In fact, you respect the person st standing inside because you want the money as well. And uh, when you take the money, you don't want somebody rushing in. So you're willing to stand. But you know, there is a kind of reasoning that's going on in these two contexts. And they are different. And we don't see any real inconsistency in this. OK, now what about the next? No. What about now? Something is going on. Yeah, I think I'll come here and do it. Or you give me the, that's simpler. OK. City traffic, OK. I think somebody must recognize that this is the silk board. OK. And uh, I couldn't find a picture where somebody is actually jumping the red light. But anyway, we are used to traffic congestion on our roads. Now, it's clear that if everyone would wait patiently, everyone would be able to move after some delay. So when you are in a traffic congestion and instead what do you see? Some jokers moving ahead, knowing fully well that anyone coming opposite is going to be stuck and uh, nobody can move. So what is going on here is typically we would like to follow the rules, but only if others are doing so as well. Right? Now, there is some rationale when you act individually and when you act in a crowd, and you would like to follow rules, but as I said, how am I going to ensure that everybody is following the rule? There is a, I think I should just stand here, right? Now, there is a very important rationale which we hear all the time. Why are you doing this? Everybody does it, right? If everybody does it, so I can I? So, now all these situations involve some rational action, 
right? Rational in the sense that something that we can justify. Now, when an individual acts in some so social situation, she's following some pattern of reasoning. What is that reasoning? That's something that's interesting to me. Is there a pattern of reasoning that applies to society as a whole? Whatever that means. I don't even know how to define it, but is there something like social reasoning? From individual reasoning, is there some way we can talk about collective or social reasoning? I think I should give up on this, right? Shall I give up on this? Yeah. Okay. So if yes, can we characterize such a logic? And that is the... Of course, question is why bother? I hope we can take it up as we go along. Now, in social context, whatever procedure that you are talking about, an algorithm is the word that I would like to use, might be actually quite opposite to what the designer of the procedure had in mind. Now, this is something that's worthwhile keeping in mind. Consider this problem. There is a two-horse race. Okay? It's a classical race. The faster horse is the winner. What's the easy procedure? Put two people on it and ask them to ride like hell. Whichever horse comes first gets the prize. And that's something that you see in race courses. Slight twist now, I'm sorry. No. I think you should. Yeah. So, two horse race. Losing horse gets a prize. This is what I say. Now, the jockeys look at each other. Should I start? You start first. He says, he says you start first. So who's going to start, right? Should they run the race at all? So what is the solution to that? Solution is very simple, switch horses. I ride your horse, you ride mine. And we run for our lives, right? And uh, well, the slower horse will get the prize and I hope my horse will get the prize, right? Yeah, so you have a capability or a procedure developed with something in mind, but it can be used in a completely different way and for a very different purpose as well. I have put an incentive there, something we can think about. So, what do we mean by logical properties underlying solutions? Right? What is logic here? Right? Let's take an example of a key. Now, supposing I buy a house and I get a key, key to the house, the key signifies two things. One is it enables me to enter the house, without the key I cannot enter, and the other is its right of possession, right? When I'm walking around with it and a policeman stops and I can say, okay, this is my house, here is a key to it. The key represents both a possibility and a right. When I lose the key, I'm, I, lose, I cannot enter, right? I'm not enabled, but it still remains my house, I hope so, right? The thief who steals the key is enabled because he can enter the house, but has no right to enter, right? So these are two different things and the key represents both and these are logical properties, right? Now, look at a login password. A login password is also like a key. Does it have the same properties? I'm not going to answer it. I want you to think about it and I think this is the sort of thing I want to think a little bit about. In fact, security, the key is a thing, you know, talks about security, right? Security properties highlight the need for a formal logic very nicely. We all talk about something like secrecy. What is secrecy? What is meant for X should not be seen by some Y. Then there is privacy, and these two are very different things, right? I don't want to, I'm not, there's nothing secretive about it, but I want it to be private, right? Where access to something that belongs to me is allowed only when I grant access to it. You have no business looking into my pockets. There's nothing secret in my pockets. But why should you look into my pockets? Authentication. What purports to come from X actually is coming from X. Then there is integrity. What was sent to X reaches X without somebody actually meddling with it in between. Now, whole lot of such lists you can write. Right? These properties is what I'm talking about as reasoning. Right? Can I talk about the relationship between these properties? Note that security also has one thing. Right? If you want to feel secure, you need a proof of security. If you have any doubts about whether it's secure or not, you're not going to feel secure. Right? So feeling secure already gives you the need for a proof, and that's the domain of logic. Logic is about proving things, arguing things, inferring stuff, 
and that's what I'm talking about. So here is it. So I've said social procedures. I even talked about what a procedure somebody intends may be uh, used in a different way. But what does it mean to design social procedures? I'm not going to talk much about it. I just want to take one example. And this is a, a famous problem, an interesting problem. Fundamental social problem is resource sharing, right? There is so much resource and everybody wants to share. And what better way to think about it than think of a cake, right? M offers a cake. Who's M? Well, to be shared by two children A and B, who are notorious for fighting with each other. And they, you should, and M, whose gender is clearly unspecified, who comes and says, okay, divide the cake and walks away. Now, how are they going to divide it among each other, right? In a way that both are equally unhappy or equally happy, right? One should not be more happy than the other, and that's important. Okay. Now, how do you divide the cake? Well, think about it. Every culture has some story of this kind, right? I cut, you choose. Tamil, there is the story with two monkeys and one appam and so on, right? Yeah. This is a folk thing. Every folk tale has something like this. Now, why is it that I cut and you choose works, right? If I cut it into unequal pieces, you have first choice, you will walk away with the bigger piece, right? So, it's in my interest to make sure that I cut it into exactly equal pieces and so that no matter what piece you pick, I have something decent left for me afterwards, right? So, I cut, you choose works for two persons. This you can think of as a procedure or an algorithm for the two to share the resource in a way by which both are happy. Now, I don't have any right to complain because no matter what you pick, I get a piece that is that makes me happy. You have no right to complain because you get first choice, right? You can examine the two pieces, check whatever is good for you. I'm, a, I'm of course assuming that the cake is homogeneous in some nice way and so on. Because otherwise, if all the kaju is on one side, you may have a problem, right? So, okay. So let's assume that there is some nice geometry there I don't need to worry about. These are all mathematical cakes anyway. So can you generalize this to n persons? Well, with three persons already, it's not easy. Okay. I cut and you choose who? One person cuts. Among the other two, who would you like to be? Whoever who chooses first, right? Of course. And the other one is going to complain. Now, there are lots of solutions possible. You should really think about it. It's a lot of fun. And uh, one way to generalize to n persons to say is that, okay, one person cuts a piece, passes it around. If nobody else has any objection, you take it and go. Well, what if you do have an objection? She has an objection. So what can she do? She can say, hey, this is too much for him, right? She can cut it. She can diminish the piece and pass it around. Not in my name because I will object to, right? Because I wanted a piece and she has cut it. So she's reduced it. So she puts her name and passes it around, right? And then it goes to somebody else who says that's too much for her and slices it even more, right? Reduces it even more and you pass it around more. You keep on doing that. Now, will you keep reducing it again and again, the same person? No, because you had a chance to diminish it as much as you liked in the first place. So there is a cake, there are n persons, there can be at most n minus one reductions, right? So there'll be the last person who diminished it, who walks away with it. Now, this is a solution. You, that person takes it, walks away, and there are, you know, there's a smaller cake, n minus one persons. Of course, you'll object. What happened to that? She reduced it, right? What happened to that reduced piece? It goes back into the cake and magically aligns itself. Don't worry about it. There's a nice thing about mathematical cakes, right? So it's put back into the pool, Cake realigns, you continue. Smaller cake, n minus one persons, repeat. Now, this is a solution attributed to Banach and Cluster, and these names should make you sit up and notice what are these guys doing with, you know, things like cake and so on. Right? And uh, actually, there is more to say, but it's clear that when you start dividing resources, a lot of questions arise, right? Is the division optimal? Is there another division preferred by all the players? Can, imagine you come up with a way of dividing up the resource by which everybody is unhappy. Everyone prefers some other way and you have actually come up with a division. Is that, so that's something you don't want, right? 
What about, uh, is it equitable? Now, that's a beautiful word. You can define it in many ways. Here is one way. Has everyone got equal share according to each person's measure? Each person's measure of satisfaction in the cake may be very different, right? I might want all the creamy part. You hate cream, right? You might want the portion with the, you know, kishmish and whatever, right? So we may all have very different preferences on these things. Now, but is it possible that despite these difference in measures, is it possible that everybody has got equal measure? And uh, is it uh, envy free? This would be really nice, where according to my own measure, I feel I have got the maximum. Right? And everybody feels that way. Is that possible? And uh, okay, here is a, I'm not going to go through this. This is to show you, and at least I can refer to Erika Klarek's beautiful exposition of it in the Quanta magazine. Go look it up. It's a very nice. Uh, presentation of that, even for three persons, coming up with a solution is quite complicated and very interesting. I'm not going to go into this. This is to tell you that some interesting procedures are there. But this envy free question was asked by Steinhaus in 1948. And he showed that there is a solution. There is an envy free solution. What does that mean? You have the cake, n persons who have different measures of satisfaction on it, potentially. There are n measures on it. and he wanted additive measures. That means if I get this piece and I get so much satisfaction, if I get that piece and I get so much satisfaction, if you give me together, the satisfaction adds up. Not a very nice thing for cake, because at some point you will start, you know, saying it's too much, right? Hopefully. Yeah? And so, but at least for additive measures, he showed that there is an envy free solution. It's a nice application of what is called the Borsu Kulam theorem a beautiful one. The very mathematization of a problem like this is extremely interesting, that you can do this and. But then, being a good mathematician, he said there exists a solution, go find it, right? And of course, how do you actually come up with a procedure for even three people was not clear until, 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 yeah, 1962, Conway and Selfridge gave a procedure for three players and they ended saying that, huh, that's the one that was shown just to flash at you. But uh, then he said, they end saying that, oh, we don't know how to do it for four. And then 1968, they came up with one. Let me skip the story. Brahms and Taylor gave one solution in 1995 that was asymptotic in the sense that you take the cake, people keep reducing some smaller, some piece comes, this is allotted, then you take the small piece, run the procedure, run the procedure, it goes on forever asymptotically. And uh, they gave it for arbitrarily many players. And then as recently as, okay, no, 2016, um, there is a solution given by Aziz and McKinsey, which uh, is, uh, is not asymptotic, it terminates how many rounds of division it takes, n power, n power, n power, n power, the, uh, it's a tower of height six, and they are working on bringing it down to three. But anyway, it's bounded. And this I cut you choose has many, many applications. Uh, these kind of procedures have a lot of applications in uh, mergers, divorce settlements, you know, many, many kinds of uh, things that we can think of where resource sharing division is involved. What I like particularly is 1993 UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, where they were discussing uh, exploring underwater, under ocean resources. And, uh, they are all done by multinational companies from Europe and the US at the time. Now China is also getting into the act. And, uh, but then developing countries objected that we don't get access to any of these. So pretty much it's I cut you choose, generalized to N persons. And basically those uh, companies explore the underwater resources, but the first right to use them is for the countries adjoining um, you know, by land next to that, wherever that area is. So this is a very crude way of putting it. It's more sophisticated. But this is just to say that there are many such procedures that are possible. To some extent, we can actually employ them in particular situations. One particular procedure that we all use and we consider important is uh, elections in any democracy. Now, mechanisms for implementing elections are crucial for democracies. And hence, you may say, a formal theory is very important. Now, what logical properties? Like I said about logical properties of keys, of anything that we are talking about, right? What do we expect for this social procedure? Now, certainly, 
eligibility of voters. This is a fundamental property you expect, right? Only those who have a right to vote, who are eligible to vote, should vote, certainly. Well, confidentiality of votes, right? I mean, my vote should remain confidential, whom I voted for. This is something that you basically expect. But is that all? Other properties? Any more? Lots. Actually, if you look at a theory of elections, there is a lot more that you can ask for. Like, for instance, you should want universal verifiability. What does it mean? We can check that every cast vote has actually been counted. Can you imagine an election where all votes are confidential and only eligible peoples have, people have been, you know, voting, but at the end only half the votes have been actually counted? Don't think these are all imagination, imaginary things. These are all true of many uh, elections in the world. Individual verifiability. How about a democratic right by which I insist that every voter can in principle check that her vote has been counted? We don't have it here, but I'm saying this is something that you can reasonably expect in a democracy. No summaries. This is extremely important, right? Partial results are not available until all voters are voted. Because if results start coming in uh, by 1 o'clock, you know what is going on. You know what people are going to do at 2 o'clock. Receipt freeness. This is, I think, something extremely important. No voter should be able to prove to another how he or she voted. Why not? Because somebody can threaten me saying that I'll break your legs if you don't show that you voted for me. Right? I mean, coercion is a very common thing in terms of elections or bribes. You know, she can say, I'll give you 1,000 rupees later if you come and prove to me that I voted for you, right? In fact, I'd prefer the 1,000 rupees than the terror of my legs being broken, right? But in general, it's very important at the end of the election that nobody should be able to prove to somebody else that you voted. Now, and this is only a partial list. There are more interesting properties, but at least already this set of properties is very interesting. So... A, an important logical question to ask, can we prove that all these requirements are logically consistent? You have put, you know, I said eligibility, confidentiality, verifiability, all the stuff. Now, are these requirements consistent? This is a logician's question. That means, another way to ask, can we even, you know, run an election in which all these properties can be guaranteed? And what do you think? The answer is yes or no. Well, can I have a show of hands, please? How many people think yes? Wow. <laughs> How many people think no? I think the pessimists win. The, there is a theorem. Now you can set up formally all these things and prove that there is no election procedure that guarantees that all these properties together. So they are not consistent. But there is also some good news because there is a theorem which says that if you give up on either universal verifiability or individual verifiability, then there exist election procedures that assure all of these but one. Now, what's going on here? What I'm pointing out is that there is, this is a formal property. This is a resultant logic. It's a result. You formalize these things in a formal logic and you can prove theorems of this kind. And this tells us something about the kind of electoral procedures that we are working with. And uh, this, such proofs require formal mathematical logic. And this is really what I mean by looking for logic in social practices. Now, I have only talked about the procedural aspect of elections. What about the very purpose of election in a democracy? It's supposed to represent the will of the people, right? It sounds very nice. But can we understand that in any formal sense? Now, we all use majority in elections, right? Now, when you have preferences over candidates, over electoral parties, over toothpaste, whatever you can think of, it's very reasonable to say that if you prefer A over B, and you prefer B over C, then you prefer A over C, right? Transitivity is a normal property that you assume, you think it's rational. Now, does this hold for groups of people? It's a very simple counterexample to say that's not true. Well, suppose there are three persons, and uh, I wanted to have political party names, but I was told not to, so I'm using A, B, C. So, person one's preference is A over B over C, person two is B over C over A, 
and person 3 is C over A over B. Some preferences that are given to me. Now, it's clear that a majority, 2 out of 3 prefer A over B. You can see, right? 1 and 3. A majority, again, 2 out of 3 prefer B over C. Now, if you conclude at this point, therefore, that a majority prefer A over C, you are wrong. Only a minority, that is only 1 out of 3, prefer A over C. So, this tells you that the majority function is not a very good thing to employ if you want to talk about the will of the people, right? So, you need some other function. So, these things are called social welfare functions. So, in general, you can ask if you have n people, n persons, and I have got a vector of preferences for each of them. If I've got all of these, can I derive some aggregate preference, some collector preference? If that is so, that function, what are the conditions it should satisfy? What are the properties you want? Like we listed for elections, we said, right? Here, what are the properties you would want? Now, these are particular conditions that come from Kenneth Arrow. They are actually very reasonable conditions to think about. One says that F can handle any combination of individual preferences at all, right? It should not be that for a particular combination it works, you know, people should be free to prefer as they like. Another is, the function should not give up. It should actually produce an ordering, maybe, maybe with ties. And uh, it should respect unanimous strict preferences. That means if everybody prefers A over B, the final solution should prefer A over B. Even if one person differs, that may be different. But if there is a unanimous preference, that should be respected. Then non-dictatorship. It should not be that, you know, F completely ignores people and then picks the preference of one particular person. There should not be a single person whose preferences dictate the whole thing. And the last is a little tricky. It says that if I want to find out whether socially X is preferred over Y, whether individuals prefer X over some other Z should not matter, right? So, I should be, if I want to socially decide X is preferred over Y, I should look at individual preferences on X over Y and the presence of some other alternative should not matter. These are the conditions that were put forward by Kenneth Arrow, who was this, and uh, studied in 1951. And this is the celebrated theorem of Kenneth Arrow in 1951. And showed that these conditions are incompatible. Once again, these are inconsistent, is the term that I would use. That, I mean, these are conditions on functions, these are not propositions of the kind that I talked about. So, in any case, this is a kind of impossibility theorem that you've got again, right? And Amartya Sen extended this uh, framework by bringing in utilities, and in fact, he generalized it and cleaned up this in very nice fashion. And the Arrowson framework now lends itself to the study of many kinds of aggregation problems where you have some things given for individuals and I want to derive something for society. But all this, there is some logic going on and that's what I'm really interested in. Okay, here is Amartya Sen, whose capability approach. So these are all Nobel laureates in economics for talking about these things. Perhaps the most important domain where these considerations apply is that of law. Now, rights and duties or obligations have inherent conflicts, right? My right uh, can impinge on somebody else's right, right? And uh, these need to be resolved procedurally, and this is the problem for law, right? I need to resolve them, but a it is a matter of procedure how I resolve them. So I need to come up with procedures for implementing these things. And uh, the, a very popular example is the clash between right to free speech and the right not to be insulted. And this is something that you see all the time in India. Right? The biggest challenge is how to fit a new law within a framework of existing law. Now, in the legal jurisprudence community, if you want to talk about the biggest problem, this is, would be considered the biggest problem. I want to introduce a new law. How do I make sure that it's consistent? After all, you are bringing in a new law because you have found some problems. Right? How do I make sure that the new law maybe replaces something particular, but it may be contradicting a whole lot of other things. How do I dis derive these contradictions? How do I find out these inconsistencies, detect them and remove them? Hopefully because we want a rational, logical society. I don't know, but I hope so. 
And this is kind of precisely the kind of logical issue we are talking about. So, we've been talking about formalization. I said, you have to formalize these things in some logical language, do inferences, prove theorems of this kind, but what's the kind of logic we are talking about? Is there a logic of it at all? Well, the good old logic of mathematics is more than enough for talking about all that we have been talking about. It's called first order logic, in which the mathematics itself has been formalized. So 20th century started with crisis in foundations of mathematics, started with anomalies, um, and uh, early um, 20th century was uh, when, well, I think I have something to say. David Hilbert in 1900 at the International Congress of Mathematicians posed 20 problems, 23 problems for mathematicians to solve. And the second of them said, prove that the axioms of arithmetic are consistent. Now, this is something that should be frightening people because arithmetic is something that you teach to children in primary school, right? Now, arithmetic is what we use for this. But it's extremely important to make sure that whatever procedure that I follow is consistent, right? I learn algebra in school, all kinds of rewriting I learn. Are they, you know, reliable, right? I hope they are reliable and that's why you teach them and we do them, right? But the notion of consistency is extremely important and people have been bothered by that and mathematicians um, were worried about it. Hilbert proposed this program. And then it became very clear by 1931 that at least the consistency of arithmetic could not be proved in arithmetic itself. This was shown by Kurt Gödel. Then Gensen came and showed that with a stronger system, you can in fact prove consistency, but that takes you to some kind of set theory that, okay, you have to think about. And overall, Hilbert's program died a miserable death with Gödel. But from the ashes of Hilbert's program, arose the study of mathematical logic as we know today, right? Reasoning about these things, building models, consistencies, inconsistency, we know a lot more about it. And one of the great things that it came up uh, through this was uh, Alan Turing's work, where you ask, you know, if I formulate a problem like this, I want to know, does it follow from the axioms? Is there a problem? Is there a way to derive this? And uh, Alan Turing, devised a formal model of a machine to show that there is no automatic way to do this. There is no algorithm to actually derive con the specific consequence, to check whether this is going to be a consequence of the axioms. And this machine is a model of digital computers that have changed the world in the last half a century. And von Neumann was involved in building the architecture of computers as well as programming them. He, in 1940s, he also initiated the study of game theory way of formalizing interactions with where you have some goals. And the formalization that I'm talking about here is a lot we have understood about logics, of logic, computation, games, all these over the last uh, century and more. And we can now devise and understand in mathematical terms logics of interaction. And the logics that we are discussing in the context of social procedures require insights from mathematical logic theory of computation, and game theory. By combining insights from all these, we can actually hope to address the kind of logical foundations I've been talking about. Now, what are the, pro again, I said we have to look at properties, right? So what are the properties of the logical framework that we are looking for? We should be able to detect inconsistencies. This is the fundamental thing, right? When we have certain properties of whatever social procedures we are talking about, we should be able to find out whether they are consistent or not. Ideally, we should be able to calculate consequences of modifying assumptions. If I go and change one law, what are all the things that must be changed? Can I calculate it in some particular fashion? We should be able to relate individual's rationale with that of some social rationale, some kind of aggregation procedure. Like I talked about in the case of traffic or in the case of the queues and so on. Somehow the individual behavior and the collective behavior, we should be able to relate in some logical fashion. And the last part is the biggest challenge. Theory of computation and the mathematical logic teaches a lot about, you know, the earlier part. Game theory suggests something, but we are really groping in the dark. There's a lot of dynamics that is involved. And these have been formulated as games. But uh, depending on how players act, the rules of the game change during the course of the game itself. This is a situation where, the, you know, Formulating it as a game is hard because the rules of the game change. Now, society can be thought of as an enforcer of game rules. 
but society often acts to change the game as well. Society changes the rules. So the dynamics is very complicated. And once again, we need formal logics to spell out the rationale underlying such dynamics. I have an example, but I'm going to run out of time. So I'm going to skip that example, I think. OK. OK. Here, um, quite a lot of these things came home to me. Two weeks ago, I was in Pune listening to a talk on open source platform for IDs, national IDs. And uh, this uh, subsequent to that, I was looking at this uh, document from the World Bank titled Principles on Identification for Sustainable Development. But the main point is that like your Aadhaar card, world over there are national digital IDs being generated and uh, you are talking about identification of every individual on the planet, right? And there are various principles being laid, laid down. Whole lot of wish lists that I hear about. So in this particular document, for instance, there is a set of 10 principles under the headings inclusion, design, and governance. They roughly correspond to, oh, they correspond to digital IDs. Inclusion is from the viewpoint of the citizen. Um, I think design is from the viewpoint of the technologist and uh, from the viewpoint of the government, respectively, and talking about what are the things that you would want. Now, we start spelling out the requirements. It's quite unclear whether they are consistent. Okay, that these wish lists run into pages and pages, right? And I would say there is a dire need for formalization and for formal logic here. Because um, the right of the state and the right of the individual are, you know, stated in some particular terms. There, there is a consonance, there is conflict here. What is going on, right? Now, this is an example of uh, need for logic, right? In the era of Google and social media, the very understanding of socialization requires re-examination. Social scientists are doing this, but logical foundations studied by mathematical means are important as well. The notions like collective beliefs, collective memory, collective action. Now, these are susceptible to certain amount of logical analysis. Now, these involve combining insights from logic, computer science, and game theory, and there's a kind of logical foundations I'm talking about. Now, here's a book that's of interest um, that I'd like to say. Here, Cathy O'Neill calls it Weapons of Math Destruction. It's a very interesting book, and where she's, you know, a beautiful analysis of what big data is doing and what are the things that we should watch out for. But this is an interesting analysis out there, but there's no formal logic in it, right? But now, as algorithms interweave into our social lives more and more, the need for logical foundations becomes stronger, right? We use words like my inbox folder, right? You have your whatever Gmail account or Yahoo account, and you say this is my folder, my mail. But you use it same like saying my pen, right? But what is this? Do they have the same logical properties? This pen, in what sense is it mine? If it is in my pocket, it's mine. Right? The moment it gets out of my pocket, it's not my pen. Right? How do I prove that it's my pen? Do you know where your inbox folder is? Can you prove that it's yours? Who has access right to it? Who has, you know, who is enabled and who has a right? Now, there are a huge amount of confusion here. Right? And, uh, and I would say that we use, uh, we speak of my community and my identity. But uh, they are very different in the digital and the physical worlds, right? The, I would say the analogy is to food, right? From the days we got food directly from farms, not very long ago, really, right? To now, where food travels great distances, comes in many different forms, right? What you eat today, for you to understand your food is very hard now. Similar thing with social relationships, right? In a space of one generation or maybe two, Social relationships, as we understood them, have completely changed. Now, social algorithms could be procedures that we underst understood in society could be understood in direct experiential terms. I'm not sure that you can do it any longer. And then, when you cannot have direct experiential understanding, mathematics helps, right? Formal logic helps. And I think we can look to formal logic to explicate certain things that we don't be understand now. So is there a logic to understand social procedures? Is there a logic of society? No, we do not have. The need for it is clear. 
we are beginning to develop some mathematical expertise in social algorithms. From theory of algorithms, dynamical systems, physics, a lot of very interesting mathematics is going on. But, you know, we are looking at some different pockets of this. Logical foundations are mostly lacking. I think we need clever young minds to think deeply about these problems, to gain insights. And I would say that instead of very clever, smart people in society contributing to the profits of Google and other corporations, you should also have a few smart young people thinking about the problems of society and develop logical foundations. Thank you.